mentioned on this side, the three men who are mentioned here were the key co-breakers. They were based um, just outside uh, Warsaw in the Prior Forest. And people from Bletchley Park actually went over in 1939 to see the work that they were doing and were massively impressed because they had actually broken the German, German, early German Enigma codes. Fat lot of good, of course, it did the polls because when the Blitzkrieg came on the 1st of September 1939, the country was just overwhelmed. Uh, heroic resistance, but no way could they resist the German Blitzkrieg. The three men who are mentioned there managed to escape initially to Paris, and then from Paris, once Paris fell, they escaped and came to England, briefly lived in these cottages here. But they were bringing with them, and don't forget, this is pretty early on, they were bringing with them the knowledge and skills of how you go about breaking the German Enigma codes. Now that Enigma machine comes in a whole range of varieties. It, I mean, it initially invented by the Sherber family, well, bought by the Sherber family, it was actually developed by, in, in Holland. But it, the rights to it were brought up by the German Sherber family, and it was a commercial product. Anybody could go out and buy one. Banks used to buy them to encipher messages between branches. So nothing terribly secret about the whole concept. But obviously it got improved over time. And that latest military version that was developed in 1939, which is the one you will see later on today, and hopefully we'll be able to use, um, was the one that the Poles had not yet cracked. But at least they had the knowledge and skills of how, how you go about doing it. So the help and guidance that they were able to give to the people of Bletchley Park is absolutely immeasurable. You, you, you've no way of knowing, of course you can't, you can't rerun history. There's no way of knowing what would have happened and how long it would have taken us to break those codes without the help and support of these Polish code breakers. Absolutely crucial part of the Second World War and often overlooked in our history books for fairly obvious reasons. We're not very often very good at praising other people, but that um, Dermot Turing's new book tells that story very vividly. So these people are absolutely crucially important. Now of course the key thing as we talked about is those submarine codes and that really was Turing's speciality and one of the reasons that Turing uh, is so high up on the list of code breakers here. Um, because they were trying to starve us into submission. Now the trouble was in 1932 the Germans uh, did a really nasty thing. They now, instead of having three wheels, rotor wheels, on the Enigma machine, put a fourth wheel on it. They called it the M3 version, which is always confusing because it just added a fourth wheel, a fourth rotor. And that meant that from that February, when that happened, right until the following December, we were unable to break the German code, U-boat um, codes. If you look at the figures for the amount of shipping that was sunk, during those months, the graph just goes up like that. The Germans now just sitting off the coast of America waiting for these convoys to come out and just sinking them left, right and centre. Some historians argue if that had continued on through that winter into the following spring, pretty certainly we would have had to have surrendered. We'd have had to make peace with Hitler. We'd have been starving and we would not have had the equipment to prosecute the war effectively. Now the fact that that code was broken was not the genius of Bletchley Park, it was the bravery of two men, Colin Fasson and Anthony Grazier. Two men aboard a British destroyer, HMS Petard, which was patrolling in the Mediterranean Sea with its sister ships and managed to trap a German submarine. The game was on then, the German submarine dived and we there have just now dropped depth charges, hopefully to explode alongside it, force it to come to the surface. Meanwhile, a small boat launched from the HMS Petard with Fasten and Glazier and a couple of other colleagues on board, waiting for the submarine to pop up. And indeed the submarine did pop up, quite badly damaged. Pops up, the German submariners all dive into the sea. Last submariner out, pulls all the plugs to really flood that submarine with water and sink it. Fasten and Glazier dive in the sea, swim across, manage to get aboard this submarine, go down the Conningstower and start to grab 
whatever they can get hold of splashing about in this water. Another young lad, Holly Brown, 15 years old, lied about his age to join up, was now on the submarine, the top of the conning tower, collecting all the stuff that these people were hanging up to him and throwing it down into the launch that was now alongside the submarine. And he could feel that the submarine was, was sinking and he was screaming at them to get out of there. And they were still splashing about, ignoring him and handling him stuff. Suddenly, just like when you fill up a bottle with water and the, sort of, the neck suddenly fills up, so this submarine suddenly filled up with water and sank like a stone, taking Fasten and Glazier to their deaths. The submarine's never been found. Threw Tommy Brown into the water, fished him out, put him in the boat, got the boat back to the main ship. That information got back to Bletchley Park at the beginning of December 1942 and included amongst it was the German code settings, the naval code settings for the submarines for the whole of December. You don't have to be a genius now to break the code, it's all done. And because they could see the way in which the pattern, the pattern of the writing, after that, when it became into January, and they hadn't got it, they could crib it, they could guess it. They could guess where the wordings were. And by that way, every day, the rest of the war, the German submarine codes were broken. 